Welcome to Discovering. Look close enough in just about any town across the Upper Peninsula and you'll find someone who practices a tradition of turning grapes into wine. Tonight, a trip to Felch for a look at a winemaker who's about as traditional as it gets. My grandpa always said 90 days for sure, but it's pretty fizzy after 90 days, but we've got to try it. And we'll take a look at a UP rock collector who's turning gemstones into jewelry. Sit back and put your feet up. That's all tonight, right here on Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a longtime lover of northern Michigan. I'm not necessarily what you'd consider an avid connoisseur of wine, but I'm also not impartial to a chilled glass of red relaxation at the end of a long day. And I've had the opportunity to partake in a handful of wine tastings here in the UP, as well as the picturesque wine country of California. From what I can remember, my favorites have come from right here in the Upper Peninsula. You may recall some time ago I did a show about the Northern Sun Winery in Bark River. With a look at how they start with this, and end up with this. Well, here's a look at the other end of the spectrum. What they are, these are all Zinfandels from the Lodi region in California, and this guy orders them in by the uh, a big semi-trailer load comes in down there and uh, we actually got to help them unload and there's all different kinds of grapes uh, Cabernet, uh, uh, Zinfandel, Merlot, uh, Pinot Grigio, anything you want you just got to call and ask them and, and uh, after a while talking to them I started mixing the grapes now. Last year I made like a 50% blend of Cabernet and Zin that turns out really good this year I got uh, Merlot, Cabernet, and Zin to try that. I made uh, Pinot Grigio for a friend of ours before uh, last year. That came out really good. Very flavorful. It was actually tasted like bananas at the end. So uh, Chardonnay, uh, Moscato, you can see that in the store. Anything you want. Just got to pretty much have been doing it since I'm a kid. So with grandpa and whatnot. So about 12 years now on my own. So, uh, when we get them, and bring them, bring them home here. This thing, pressure, you can see the wheels right here. When it goes on top, this is spinning, it sucks the grapes through and it breaks them up. And then they go into here and we kind of poke in there with a stick and keep them even as they're coming up. And a few days later, they start to get warm. And if you ever notice on a grape, it has like a white film on it. And that's where your yeast comes from. So the grapes, pretty much, as long as you get them at the right temperature, they do their own work. All you gotta do is monitor them, come out here, kind of mix it up every day, make sure it doesn't grow any mold or anything on top of it. And before you know it, you're draining about a couple weeks it takes, and the sugars start to break, break down and turn into alcohol, and you're making wine. <laughs> All the solids push up and the liquid is underneath kind of like a septic tank you know 
but that's what happens and we drain all the juice off first you know there was the line and now all that juice is coming on the bottom well we're putting the, the cage back together to put our great juice we can get out of it to put in our barrels This cylinder that's on here is actually overkill. It'll blow this thing right apart. As you can see, we had to modify it a couple times here because we got a little greedy. The cylinder actually came off of a, it was a lift cylinder for a old Belmet skitter. And I just cut it down and rebuilt it and resealed it and there she goes. Well, there's a few things you can do with it. Um, well, most of the time I, I, I got pigs in the back and I give it to them and they start to eat it and it gets kind of comical after a while. <laughs> but uh, lots of people, uh, old timers and whatnot, they'll take and they'll re-chop re this up and they'll add sugar to it and water and they'll make what's called a second wine. It's kind of a lighter version of, of what we're doing right now. Like I said, it's lighter, not quite as flavorful, but you end up getting more bang for your buck that way, you know, so. <laughs> and what we do is each, each two barrels of the uh, fermentation barrels will make one barrel of wine. You take an even amount of the juice that comes out of the bottom and an even amount of the squeezing juice so you get that pulpy stuff mixed with the good juice and you get a good even wine then. So if you put all the juice in one and all the squeezings in the other you're going to get a totally different wine from one barrel to the other instead of good even, a good even wine. The wooden barrel makes a better tasting wine. Uh, I was always told that. Uh, I grew up knowing that and uh, these barrels are very expensive to buy new. So I did buy this 30 gallon barrel and the two behind you there, the smaller ones. What I've done and what a lot of people do is they go and, and get old bourbon barrels. And I, from what I understand, like the whiskey companies, they're only allowed to use them once and the, the, the bourbon or whatever sits in there for years on end. So they get rid of them. Uh, I've had them for uh, 12 years, you know, myself. They came actually shipped wrapped in that real tight plastic and when I took them apart and took the bungs out of them and you stick your nose in there and it smelled just like booze so they were perfect barrels 
and then uh, I learned from a couple old timers and, and my grandpa as well on how to take them apart. You know, take one end off, uh, take the three rings off and pry the cover off gently and then put the rings back on but leave the ends open. And then I use this big torch here. Just set them outside and, and make an inferno, a big fire in there. And all you got to do is kind of keep this very edge nice and soaked with water so you don't burn out the, because there's actually a groove in here where this cover fits. And then when I'm done with that, I got some, some wax I just melt in here and you let them dry out. And then when we get these grapes and put them in the fermentation jugs after a couple days and I start filling these with water. Actually, my kids do it. They run the hose and they just stick it in there until the water comes out and day after day, pretty soon it keeps swelling up, swelling up and they hold water. Therefore, they'll hold wine and empty them out, clean them out and away we go. Well, rule of thumb, there's 36 pounds in a box. And what I was told when I first started, it was three gallons. Three gallons per box. However, it did work for a couple of years. But then it seemed, the one year the sugar content was so high, it was, it was like syrup. It was really thick. And I didn't have quite enough to fill the barrels. I mean, I can't have that. So I didn't know what I was going to do. So from from then on, an old timer helped me out with that, by the way. He, he, he had some barrels and stuff, and I, I did some rearranging to save that year. But since then, uh, I've went with two and a half, two gallons. So if, if, if you take, it was 18 boxes of grapes to fill a barrel. Now, the barrels are supposed to be 50, 55 gallons, but they're, you know, they're old barrels. They're not perfect. So I always go that extra. I always get that extra. And you always want to have an extra bottle of wine. You want to have that for, for topping off. So if I don't have enough, I'm going to end up with air, air space in the wine. It could, it could change the flavor of the wine, whatever, whatever else. So I up that to two and a half gallons per box or whatever. I always, I always put 20 boxes instead of 18. So I, and I, that's worked about the last eight, nine years or whatever. I go 20, 20 boxes per barrel. And that's worked out good for us since. Uh, we filled this one earlier, and after it goes in there, you top that off, you push this down, it still continues to work in the barrel. And that's why you see this, this is pushing up, and this is a trap. And what I usually do is put like, uh, like a little bit of brandy or something in there, so just to keep it sterile. And the gases will come out of it, and the air won't go back in. So it's a little wine protector here, and then I've had it before my first couple of years doing it on my own where I, I put a, a wooden cork in it too early and I came out there and, and hit it with a hammer to, to get it off to check the wine and see what it was tasting and it actually flew up and hit the ceiling right past my head so lesson learned. My grandpa always said 90 days for sure but it's pretty fizzy after 90 days but you gotta try it. You know, we're, we're just in October now so around Easter I'll, I'll start taste testing it, looking at it, and seeing how clear it is. And if I like how it is, personally, then I take one gallon or four liter bottles and I cap it off and away it goes and I just box it up and leave it sit. Kind of keeps it right where it's at. And that's, that's about it. It's not really rocket science, I guess. <laughs> Some of the people that get the, the same grapes that we get do put the sulfites and the preservatives and right by a recipe that they get either off a website or, or wherever. But that's something I don't do. That's something I want to get away from. I, I don't recall uh, these, these old timers that I learned from ever putting that stuff in there. And as long as you jar it up and keep it sealed, uh, it, it, it's been fine. I've kept it up to three years and we have drank it and it was just fine. So no preservatives and doesn't everybody want to get away from preservatives? So. Might as well have it not in your food and not in your drink either, I guess. So. Uh, I think I got uh, myself, um, a couple of friends, and two of my cousins, and 
some guys just awesome. buy in and split a barrel each and they'll and they'll take their stuff home after it's done um like i said jeff over here he'll take his wooden 10 gallon barrel home it's easy enough for him to handle and he'll put it in his, in his own basement but then i'll have my stuff here and i keep this building uh, roughly 40 50 degrees through the winter so it doesn't freeze and have problems so but yeah we, we enjoy it it's 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 been fun it's a kind of a once a year thing everybody gets together we uh my favorite thing to do is to have uh, good friends good food and good drink so <laughs> can't beat it and this is what it looks like when it's done Deer season is right around the corner, and if you haven't already done it, it's time to make sure your gun is on the mark. Here's a tip on resting your rifle when sighting in. You go out and you want to use a good rest. Now you can get as exotic as you want with it. They make all kinds of them nowadays that are very good. One of the less exotic ones is the uh, lead sled that you see here, and it, it solidly holds your gun in place while you're sighting in so that you're assured that what the target is telling you is exactly what's happening. It takes the variables of the human element out of it so that you actually know what, what the, uh, the firearm is performing as. Regardless of whether you use a rest like this or if you use sandbags, uh, these, these don't have sand in them, they just got uh, corn in them, but they work well. Um, regardless what you're using, you do not want to support your gun by the barrel. You don't want any pressure on that barrel at all because that will uh, change your point of impact on the target. So you want to support by the fore end and by the butt stock, of course, and you want it to be as solid as possible. You want to be shooting off a good solid bench you don't want to just throw a couple of uh, jackets on the hood of your truck and rest the rifle on that and think that that's good enough. That's not going to give you an accurate uh, reflection of what the, what the gun is actually doing. The Upper Peninsula is home to more than 150 different collectible rocks and minerals, making it a very popular place for rock hounds from across the country. Here's a look at one rock collector who turns rocks into works of art. I've been really fortunate to live here in Michigan in the Upper Peninsula because there's so many collectible items here. There's uh, several gemstones, Michigan State gemstone, the greenstone comes from the Upper Peninsula up in the Keweenaw area. It was really known on Isle Royal, but it's still found on the mainland in many places. Uh, Kona Dolomite is an ornamental stone that's cut into cabochons and used for jewelry that's collected near Nagani, Michigan. Um, datalites are white and pink and salmon colored and they come out of copper country and they're a beautiful gemstone. So there's a lot of things here and that's not even to mention of course the Lake Superior agates. Uh, copper specimens come from here and there's the big band of iron uh, mining area from Marquette through Dickinson County and all the way out to Iron County. So and then a lot of minerals come from there too. There's gertite and hematite, and a lot of jaspers that can be cut and polished into jewelry and gemstones. So there's a lot of things here in this area, a lot of things to find. And even if you go all the way to the other end of the peninsula on the eastern end and just go below it, you can get Petoskey stones, the Michigan State Rock. So there is quite a bit of things to find in the whole area. I got started when I was like five years old. I walked down the street and I picked up a rock out of everybody's driveway. And that was my first rock collection. It wasn't uh, real serious or anything, obviously, at the time. And 
as I got older, I kind of played with it. I had a small rock collection most of my life. And we got a little sheet of silver. And when I was in my late 20s, some friends of mine came by and they had uh, started becoming rock dealers. They had gone crystal mining and were traveling around the country selling rocks and stopped by my house and showed me what they were doing. And at the time I was working as an assistant manager at a plastics factory. And the week, the week after they left, I quit my job, and sold everything I owned, started doing this, and I've been starving ever since. What I'm gonna do is uh, start taking off all this extra silver sheet around the design that we just made. A lot of people like to use a uh, flex shaft or a Dremel tool to do this part, but I prefer the file. I have more control. I've been doing it for years. I started collecting all these rocks and I thought, what am I going to do with all these rocks? And I learned how to polish them and cut gemstones out of them. And then I had a whole bunch of gemstones that I had cut and polished and didn't know what to do with those. We have a little pendant. Now, when you heat sterling silver, you bring some of the impurities out to the surface. It just happens as you heat it. And that's why it has that dark color. Um, there's a, a mixture of different acids that we put it in, and it takes that color out, that discoloration off. A lot of it's copper that rises to the surface. So I learned how to silversmith so I could make jewelry, and now I got a bunch of jewelry I don't know what to do with. So that was the evolution of where I got to where I am today. Um, I really still sell a lot of rocks. I, that's my first love. You can see all the rocks I have here. I still sell them on the internet. I do a pretty brisk internet business and mineral specimens. And I do a lot of art and craft shows around the peninsula, all around the area. And I'm not getting rich, but I'm certainly paying all the bills and I'm having a good time not having a boss. So. Well, that's it for tonight. If you'd like to keep tabs on what's coming up on Discovering or see where we've been, you can join us on Facebook or go to 906outdoors.com. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week right here on Discovering. Discovering.